swagmen often camped beneath the stand of trees near our house. They slipped their swags off their shoulders and rested there, or stood looking speculatively at the house and the wood heap before coming in to beg some tucker. Good morning. Father had humped his bluey in Queensland and was familiar with the ways of swagmen. Good campsite, that one, isn't it? Mother was well known to those swaggies who's beat past our home. She always gave them bread, meat and tea without asking them to chop wood in return. If you go up to the house, my mother will give you something to eat. That is, if you need anything. Well, I'm off to school. Last day before the holidays. Are any buck jumpers lately? Nah, I soon will be though. So it's your last day of school, huh? Too right. Well, climb up and I'll give you a lift. Steady, boy, steady, yeah. Walk on, boys. Stay, isn't it? Certainly is. What's the bush like where you go, Mr. McLeod? Ah, it's thick and you'll see around here. I hell it is. Yeah? Mm, thicker than the hairs in the back of a dog. Maybe it's even thicker. It's maiden bush. Bush that's never known the axe. Mm, wish I could see it. And so you should. I'll take you up there if you want, any time you like. Would ya? As soon as your old man says it's all right. I'll be going up tomorrow morning about five o'clock. Gee, that's not early. I'll be there. I mean, that is if you're sure. I wouldn't have asked you if I wasn't. Gee, thanks, Mr. McLeod. I'm real grateful. You ask your father first. I will. Frank Radcliffe was a man so crippled by arthritis that his life was spent in an invalid chair. He often visited us, being pushed to our home by father or by some schoolboy anxious to earn sixpence. He was a naturalist and ran a column called Nature Notes in the Australasian. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. That's lovely. Oh, I'm delighted you like George Eliot. Mr. Good afternoon, Mr. Ackliffe. Dad? Hello, Alan. Good to see you. Suffering had not embittered him, nor hostility crushed the spirit behind his steady, amused and tolerant glance. He experienced hostility more than most. He was an atheist in a community where the very word roused fear Thank and repulsion, you. as at the sight of a snake. What are you doing, I'm so soon? Mr. Tucker let you out early? Yes, a bit. 
I've got to lift with Mr. McLeod this morning. Yeah, did you see that swaggy down by the gate? Or over under the trees? Well, he's known as the fiddler. Huh? Well, not because he plays it all, but when he's talking, he cocks his head to one side like he was playing away. Oh, I see. You know, you can always work out a swaggy by the number of straps, turns he has around his swag. One strap, that's a new chum. If he's got two, he's looking for work. And three, he doesn't want to find it. Oh, well, there's four straps, but they're pretty rare. It's a travelling delicate. And the fiddler? Uh, definitely a three-strap man. Allergic to work. <laughs> I never knew that. About the straps, I mean. I thought it would interest you. Mm. Uh, you never cease to amaze me how you use them in your stories. <clears throat> now, the boy, he wants to be a writer. Oh, do you, Alan? Because I told him writing a book's the hardest thing in the world. Well, I must say I approve, my boy. But what you want to do is keep a notebook like I do. Or something a bit bigger, otherwise you'll strain your eyes. And when you hear a yarn as good as your father tells, or see something interesting or quirky, then note it down. Or more often than not, you'll never look at it again. But somehow it gets remembered. Just when you need it. Of course, you never make any money. And never miss an opportunity, Alan, to experience something new. Keep broad horizons. And you'll always write more honestly if it's first hand observed. Mr. McLeod this morning asked me to go away to the bush with him. He's leaving first thing in the morning. What's that? He said it's right with him, if it's right with you, Dad. Oh, I don't know, Alan. Well, up at the log splitters camp. Now, that's a good hike, son. Well, it's not the trip I'm worried about. You know what men are like when they're shut up in the bush. Oh, they'll be drinking and swearing all right, but that won't hurt him. It's only the kid who never sees men drinking or swearing that takes it up himself. My boy's 11. He's far too young. Oh, please, Mum. After all you've said about Peter McLeod. Well, hang on. Peter's a rough diamond, I'll grant you that. He's fair. Straight as a die, he wouldn't do the boy any harm. Might pay off in the end. Well, like Frank said, if he wants to be a writer, well, then what he's got... that's not what you meant, is it? Well, Mrs Marshall, I'm sure I don't know the man. But since you press me, I must say I like what I hear. Can I go there, Mum? Can I, please? Go on, let him, Mum. He'll only get under our feet. Well, what time did he say he was going? Five o'clock. Good heavens. Now, you see, you give him all the hope you can. Show him the breed all's good. I will. And anything you don't want to use, you pass it on to me. <laughs> <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning. You'll need to be up at four. Gulp your food down like that. There's plenty of time. Did you wash yourself properly? Yes, Mum. Behind your ears? Yes, Mum. And all around my neck. Now, don't forget, brush your teeth every morning with salt. I put your brush in here and I put your old trousers in too. Your boots clean? Yes, Mum. No, they're not. You take that off and I'll black them. Make sure Mary remembers to feed the birds. She will. Now the possum's got plenty of greens, but he'll need some bread. Alan, don't fast. She'll know what to do. Hurry up, Mum. There's plenty of time. No one's up in the world yet, are they? No. You're the first one up in the whole world. You'll be a good boy, won't you? Of course I will. You, Alan. What are you doing here this hour of the morning? Cripes, you're not coming with me, are you? I thought you asked me. What? Well. Well, of course I asked you. I've been waiting here for hours. You said five o'clock. Well? Ten I'm early. Are you now? 
I brought me tucker. Mum gave us a round of corned beef. Did she now? Well, you better stick it in the box then. We'll add that tonight. You want a hand? No, I'm right, thanks. Father says if you rest your hand on a strong horse, the strength of him goes right through you. You're not running out on your old man now, are you? He did say you'd come. Of course he did. Grapes, I'll never understand your old man. Yeah, I like to get up at picking any dawn. Gives a man a proper working day. Now, that's old man O'Connor bringing in his cows. He's early this morning. Must be off somewhere. Now, the clearance sale to buy that Abbott buggy he's got his eye on. What he's doing with an Abbott buggy when he still owes me 10 quid for fence posts, I'll never know. Yeah, settle down, boy, settle down. That's a boy, straighten up there. That's what you get for trusting a man. He's driving around in a buggy while I'm still riding around in this. Come on, Freddy, Ringo, keep it going, boys. Come on now. That's a boy. That's it, that's the one. Tells me you fight like a threshing machine. What? Says there's not a man who can match you for miles. Uh, uh. Hey, your father's got a lot of time for me. Yeah, we think a lot of each other, you old man and I. They tell me he's a great runner once. I was looking at him the other day. He stands like a black fella. So he reckons I can fight, eh? Yeah. I'll never understand your old man. <laughs> Walk on. I'll show you something. All the boys. Come on down. This is the log where young Jackson broke his neck. Horse bolted and threw him. He came down this grassy track, flat out, I'd reckon. Horse shied at the log and threw him. He would have left the horse's back uh, way back there. Had a lump on his chest the size of my head. Gee. He didn't know a thing. Two months later, his old man wrapped a bullock chain around himself and walked into the dam. It's not far from here, I'll show you later. He went sort of queer after Bob's death. Not crazy or anything like that, just sort of sad. As if he'd gone broke or something. He was a real white man, old Jackson. It's a terrible thing. They say a man's brain system goes when he drowns himself, but it wasn't like that. All he needed was a mate. To say, come on, mate, give it another go. That's all he needed. Trouble was, I was out that day. 
getting the horses shot. Good fire you made, my boy. How's a leg of yours at night? Does it need to be tied down? No, just lies it. Go on. That's good. Didn't get any pain or anything? No, don't even know it's there. Well, if you was a kid of mine, I'd take that Chinaman down on Ballarat. Wang or whatever his name is. He'd have you fixed in no time at all. He's a herbalist. Father calls him a weed merchant. <laughs> Never ask what's wrong with you. Just sits there and tells you. I was crook myself a few years back, so I took a week off and drove down to see him. Never told him a thing. I was paying, let him do the finding. He just sat there, and he grabbed me by the hand, and he says, what are you wearing that bandage for? I said, I ain't wearing no bandage. He said, what do you got wrapped around you then? I said, oh, I, I just got this red flannel belt on. He said, well, take it off. It's not doing you no good. He says, uh, ever have an accident? I said, no, I never had an accident. He says, think again. I said, well, I did fall off the gig about a year ago and the wheels ran over me, but I didn't get hurt. He said, oh, yes, you did. He said, that's what's wrong with you. He said, your sides are all out. I said, is that what's wrong with me? He said, yeah. He gives me a packet of herbs for two quid. Never had no pain again. Yeah, that's your stomach. I want me legs and me back fixed. It comes from your stomach. You're blowing up like a cow and loosen. You got something in there that needs to come out. Like that girl that Wang cured. Ate like a horse she did. Yet she was so skinny she couldn't even cast a shadow. Doctors couldn't do a thing with her, so I took her down to Wang. Wang says to her, don't eat a thing for two days. And then get a plate with steak and onions and just a few potatoes and stick it under your nose. So she does as he says. The next thing you know, there's this great big tapeworm come crawling out of her mouth. Hell of a size it was. Just tumbled onto the plate, all tangled up. Must have been there for years. She got as fat as mud after that. Father says anyone can be a Chinese turbulist. <laughs> Just as long as they look like a Chinaman. But your old man doesn't know what he's talking about. Takes years and years to learn. And after they finish learning, they take him into this room, 12 at a time. And this room's got 12 holes in the wall. And they go out into the streets. That's the folks who's teaching them. And they get these people with these 12 terrible illnesses. They say to him, what's wrong with you? He says, oh, I'm crooking the cuts. He says, you come with me. And what about you? He says, oh, it's me liver. He says, come with me. And you over there with the crook leg and the crook arm, you come with me. And these people with these 12 terrible illnesses stick their arms through the wall. And the Chinese herbalists inside take them by the hand. And they've got to write down what's wrong with them. And if they get one wrong, they're out. And your old man reckons it's easy to be a Chinese herbalist. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But I won't hold it against him. We should be at the camp by lunchtime tomorrow. So you better get some shut eye. Night, Mr. McLeod. Good night, boy. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child, pity my simplicity, suffer me to come to thee. What the hell's that? Prince because of the flash clobber he wears. Not very bad with the concertina, but he's mugged with a horse. G'day, Arthur! 
Call it Arthur. Looks like a wombat. Every time I see him, I hide the spuds. Hey, Ted, did you hear about me selling the chestnut mare? Uh, no, I didn't. A young Barry bought her. Gave him a trial, but that crook leg of hers will never go against her. Uh, I reckon you're right. She's a good mare. Uh, never bred better. Take a drunk man home every time and stick to the right side of the road. <laughs> there he goes. As soon as he starts talking, he breeds that mare all over again. Well, there's a smoker already. <laughs> Who's that you got up there with you, Peter? That's uh, a mate of mine. Young Alan Marshall. Ted Wilson, Arthur, the Prince. Come on, let's buy a cup of tea off these blokes. So your leg's crook, is it? Going on the fetlock, is that what it is? Something like that. <laughs> I used to keep the red infantile paralysis. Yeah, he was a terrible crook. I reckon he'd never walk again. What are you talking about? What? What are you bloody well on about? Who? No. You, Flash Harry. What did I say? Nothing. What? Bloody nothing, but don't say it again, that's all. Come on, lad. Let's get that cup of tea. Well, back to work. See you after tea. Silly cow. Don't you take no notice, Len. Alan, why don't you go and see if the wife can get you something to eat? No, I'm right, thanks, Mr. Wilson. Go on. You can tell her we'll be along in a minute. from Torella, aren't you? Will you come in and sit down? So go on. Clear off outside. And will you pull your trousers up? Your father will be thinking you're some new breed of fowl. <laughs> oh, look at this. Here. Let me help you. Come yeah. on. Come on. Over we go. Ah. There you are. Get your cushion. You could be carrying too much acid. That could be your problem. If you want to try carrying a potato round in your pocket. Mrs. Wilson. Ed Withers. It sucks out all the acid. Well, I'll give you one and you can try it. Oh, go Anna Royal. That's the other thing. Marvellous stuff. It'll have you cured in no time. You get your mother to rub you down and it's so penetrating it'll go right through the bottle. Is he? I know all about illness. I've had my problems myself, you know. My organs were all out of place. Well, I can't have no more children, except what I've got, of course. Well, praise the Lord for something. Now, open wide. Come on, we're nearly finished. Just a few more mouthfuls. Here. Yeah, well, I'll your first thing in the morning. Uh, I've left me tobacco outside. I'll get it, Mr. McClellan. Oh, no, Alan. Well, he's all right. The boy's not hopeless. You should see the way he gets under that wagon. He made the campfire last night and helped me with the horses this morning. <laughs> so what if he's got a crooked leg? He's got arms and shoulders like a bullock. <laughs> Evening, Mrs. Wilson. Oh, hello, hello, Prince. Prince. Hello, Arthur. Hello. Oh, hi, Arthur. Hello. Should have seen that kid just now. Shot out of there like a rabbit. Hello, <laughs> 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 Mrs. Wilson. Oh, hello, welcome. Oh, sit down, boys. 
Oh, come on. Where is it? All right. Hold your horses. And I want your money on the table, too. Come on. Get your money up, fellas. Ah, we up. There's the up There we are. There we are. Oh, that was quick. Now, oh, the boy's a wonder. You could sole your boots with his guts in the last river. <laughs> Alan, come over here and sit down. Come on. No, come here, lad. Sit down here with the men. Come on. What's crutches to him? They're nothing, are they, lad? Come, my baby, tell me why you're crying. Don't you see? It pains your papa so. Every day for you nice things I'm buying. And I'd like to see you smile, you know. Then he said, I know you are the dearest. And the sweetest papa of them all. If you love me truly, you will tell me surely who's that lady's picture on the wall. There's another picture in my mother's frame. It's some other lady. Her smile is not the same. I think it is a shame There's another picture in my mother's brain Yes, my darling, it's a pretty lady And she's going to be your new mama She'll be good and kind to you And maybe you will love her so to please papa There's another picture in my mother's frame It's some other lady Her smile is not the same My mama was sweeter I think it is a shame There's another picture in Poem by the master, Adam Lindsay Gordon. <laughs> Between sky and water, the clown came and caught her. Their stirrups clashed loudly as they lit. He's forgotten the words again. <laughs> <laughs> you blokes know what it means, don't you? Some blokes don't get it. <coughs> Lucky devils. <laughs> this clown was a real fast jumper, you see. The other horse jumped first at the water jump. But the clown caught him right in the middle of the jump. Ah. That's what he means by between sky and water. And when they land, their stirrups clash. Ah, that clown must have been a well-sprung horse with plenty of daylight underneath him. Very absorbing. Oh, come on, Prince. Give us another. You've got the wild colonial boy. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yes. How about this one? In a yard where children were playing games one day A little child on crutches was watching wistfully Though she tried so hard she couldn't play as other children do They said she was a bother and in their way too Then one night when all was silent the angels came that way and took the little darling whose sweet lips seemed to say Mother, when I go to heaven will the angels let me play Just because I am a cripple will they say I'm in the way here the children never want me I'm a bother, they all say When 
I go to heaven, mother? Will the angels let me play? It's a hell of a song, Prince. But you got no right to be singing it in front of the boy. What? No right at all. Don't you worry, lad. Don't worry about it. Well, what's the matter with that? That son's all right. He knows he's crippled, doesn't he? That's where you're wrong, Prince. He doesn't know. And he won't know. Not if he lives to be a hundred. See, I'm not saying it's a bad song, Prince. But why let him into what fools think? It's always better not to know what's wrong with you. No, for heaven's sake. What's your bloody head red? I like the song in some ways. I felt sorry for the little girl, though. Wish I was there to play with her. God bless his soul. That's the most beautiful thing I've heard in my life. Between sky and water, the clown came <laughs> and caught her. Come on, Prince. <laughs> Give us a wild colonial boy. Yeah, that's yeah, a spirit yeah, lad. Good. You're telling me. There was a wild colonial boy, Jack Doolan was his name. A poor Bella's parents, he was born in Castlemaine. He was his father's only hope, his mother's only joy. The bride above his parents was the wild colonial boy. So come away, he hides to roam the mountains high. Together we Together we will die. We'll wander over valleys, we'll wander over plains, and scorn to live in slavery, bound, bound by iron chains. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a wild colonial boy. Good night, Alan. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Pleasure to meet you. You're a good lad, mate. The best mate of mates ever had. Come on, Mr. McLeod. I've got your pouch. Oh, here. you're a good lad. And you're a good mate. <laughs> Between sky and water and the clown <laughs> came. And damn it, they caught her. Oh, Good night, lad. Not Mr. Wilson. And we saw a bullet cart as well. And it was pulled by 16 beasts. And the bullocky, he said he came from Queensland. And when Mr McLeod asked him why he came down south, he said it was because his wife was still up there. She was a strange bloke. And on the way back, we nearly lost the load because part of the road slipped away. Well, I just hope you pulled your weight, Alan. Yeah, I warned and fed the horses and built the campfires. The others did the loading, though. But I did all of the counting. So you reckon it was worthwhile? Oh, it was good, eh? Uh... I got something to show you. Come here. Uh, just have a look at that. Isn't that a beauty? What do you think? That's a present for Mr. Ratcliffe. And Frank also wants you to have this. He thinks it'll make a good notebook. Thank you.
You watch yourself out there. I suppose so, if you're careful. Mary, that swaggy's back. He's resting in the chaff house. I think you better take him some stew, love. Oh, Mum, I'm in the middle of a chapter. I'll take it, Mum. All right, but you hurry back now, won't you? We're eating soon ourselves. I wish you'd gone, Mary. I'll have to go and fetch him in the end. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Mum sent some stew. Well, there's a good Christian woman. <coughs> you at the moment I seen her. I said there's a woman who's giving the boots off her feet. Oh, come on, you want me to beg? Oh, sorry. Oh, just like Mother cooked it. I'll make it a two-course dinner, eh? Meat for starters, soup to follow. What's wrong with you? I've got infantile paralysis. Oh, fancy. Well, at least it got a roof over your head. And a fine-looking head it is, too, like a Romney lamb. Am I keeping you from something? No. I've got to help you hang around like a drover's dog. Am I, am I eating yours or something? No. I'd better go. Yeah, tell him other thanks. Been on the road for long? Where do you come from? What? North or south? North? My dad reckons there's more work to the south, you know, once the harvesting gets started. Well, I'm not uh, looking for work. Oh, of course. Good place to camp, isn't it? For those that don't have to camp here, yes. Cocky told me once, you blokes is never satisfied. I give you cheese, you want to fry it. Yeah, I'm like that. And time's out on the track and I've thought, I wish I had some tea and sugar. And when I had tea and sugar, I'd want to smoke. When I had a smoke, I'd want a good place to camp. When I had a good camp, I'd want something to read. So I says to this cocky, I says, you wouldn't have any reading matter, would you? As I can see, I'm not going to be able to bot any tucker off you. <laughs> I can get you something to read if you like. Oh, no, no, please don't bother, right? I can't read. See, that's me eyes. But why'd you ask the cocky for something to read? You're a persistent little beggar, ain't you? Alan, your dinner's on the table. And mine's getting cold. I'll get Mum to heat it up for you. Now look, really, it's <laughs> it's fine. It's um, it, it's it's probably the well the, the hottest food I've ever had in my life. Oh, gee. Alan, I'll be off now. That's a good boy. See you in the morning. Yeah, if you're up bright and early. Now, why did I say that? We've got a swaggy in a chaff house. He's a three-strap man. What? He puts three turns around his swag. Look, one strap's a new chum, and two, well, two's when you're looking for work. Here he is, get him! Wow, what a beauty! I reckon we'll get ten. Well, the fiddler, he's a three-strap man. What are you so interested in swaggies for? Well, they always tell you stories. 
Well, most of the time. When it comes to stories, you make up the best ones. I reckon I've never heard anyone tell stories like you can. You've got a real knack. Hey, tell us the one about the dust storms in the outback, where you've got to sleep with a pick and shovel just to dig yourself out in the morning. Well, Swaggy told me that one. It isn't true. Dad didn't reckon, but the bloke who told me said he'd swear on a stack of Bibles. Gee. I said he didn't have to, though. Well, go on, tell us. Well, when you're out in the outback, there's a time just before the wedding. Look out! Jeez, that was close. You were lucky that was me, Alan. You would have been a goner for sure. Come on, we've got to get ten. It'll be a record. Me trousers! Quick, quick, get them out! Crikey! It's again the Lord will leave your pants off. You can do a stretch quick and lively if they catch you. Old Dobson went down to Melbourne and ran clean through the place with his pants off. They put him away for the rest of his life. Come on, we'd better get going. Come on! Gosh, I wish it wasn't a full moon. Someone might see me. Oh, you'll have to push. Well, what do I tell me mum? Christ, it's cold. Struth. It sounds like O'Connor's grey. Oh, I'm done for. What do I do? Hide over there. You'll think I'm on my own. Mr. O'Connor. Is that you, Alan? Yes, it's me. And where are you off to? I've been fishing. Fishing? Well, I never. What the devil are you doing riding round in a contraption like that in the middle of the night? You'll get run over by someone who's got himself boozed. That's what'll happen. You'll get yourself killed. I don't know. I'm damned if I can make your old man out. You ought to be home in bed. How's your old man going these days? Pretty good. He's breaking in five for Mrs Carruthers. Ask him if he'll handle a three-year-old filly I've got. She's broken to leave. How much does he charge? Thirty bob. Too much. I'll give him a quid. She hasn't got a buck in her. Would you ask him? All right. I'm damned if I know what a kid like you goes round in the middle of the night for. Well, get up. No, Mr. O'Connor. I'll tell Jack what you said. What did you stop so long for? I'm frozen stiff. If I bend my legs, I'd crack him. Come on, let's get going. Ruth, I'm cold. If we come across anyone else, just keep on going, all right? Cripes, Alan. If you tell anyone where I've been without me pants on, I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. Well, what do you got there? Eels. Four of the blighters. Yeah, mate got four as well. We would have got ten, except he fell in the creek. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty deep. He could have drowned. Go on. Yeah, but I managed to pull him out. 
You mean to tell me you can't swim? No one around here can swim, except for my mate Joe, and he can only keep afloat. Well, I reckon you ought to learn. But you can't, eh, because you're leg. Well, I knew a fellow once had both legs off. Both of them. And I'll tell you something for nothing. That man could swim like a fish. Now, you get around on them crutches pretty good. Well, any fool can walk. But if you do something that nobody else can do, like swim, well... That is the mark of a man. It is. Well, give my thanks to your father. And to your mother. And, uh, with any luck, I should be back here in a couple of months. Well. days that followed, I thought a lot about what the fiddler had said, and tried to imagine the legless man swimming like a fish. Passed by here a while ago. The fiddler. Mm hmm. Have a look at Bertie's campfire. Killed him, all right. Been on the metho for a few days. Must have rolled into the flames. Oh, that's terrible. Well, Alec reckoned that his, his breath must have caught a light and then slank down his guts like a fuse. was a three-strap man, and he knew of a man who had both legs off, and yet he could swim like a fish. <laughs> 